All right, um, everyone. So now I would like to present some to a talk on structural equation models, and we're heading towards causal analysis. So um, causal analysis is also used um, in genetic studies, of course. And when you combine um, network methods and causal inference and WGCNA, and this has um, is sometimes known under the bus word uh, systems genetics as opposed to systems biology. And so here I will present um, some material from the doctoral dissertation from Jason Aiton, and also it corresponds to chapter 11 in the Net Weighted Network book. So the title of Jason's article was Use Genetic Markers to Orient the Edges in a Quantitative Trait Network. So what is a quantitative trait network? Well, for example, a co-expression network, right? These are quantitative variables. But more generally, you could have quantitative um, um, sample traits. You could have cholesterol level, insulin level, body mass index. These are all quantitative traits. And you may want to do causal inference. You may want to say, well, if you become obese, high body weight, causes um, changes in insulin levels, for example. And um, the main idea really is to use SNPs, um, genetic markers, for learning directed networks. So, so far in, we've used an adjacency matrix which was symmetrical, right? There was an undirected network. But of course, um, it would be far superior to infer directionality to make causal statements. And it has long been recognized that genetic marker data can lend themselves for making causal inference. There's a technique known as Mendelian randomization, um, which is known in epidemiology. And, um, and then this idea has been reinvented in different shapes several times. So there's a vast literature on genetics and causal inference. So just to remind you of the fundamental paradigm in biology, we of course assume there's some sequence variation and then the DNA sequence gets um, um, transcribed into a gene expression level and then transcribed into a protein and maybe that gives rise to a clinical trait. And often you have multiple data available from the same subject, the gene expression, clinical traits, proteins, and you observe correlations. But we are often hard pressed to um, infer causality because let's say you have a clinical trait such as body weight and it's highly correlated with the gene expression profile, then you don't know um, what caused what is um, a high level of this gene causative of gaining weight, or is it the other way around? If you are obese, maybe it causes inflammation and that changes um, the expression values of the gene. So when you observe pairwise correlations, we often have a hard time understanding what causes what, except when one of the variable is a SNP. You know? If you have a strong correlation between a SNP and an expression level, you will know that it is the genetic variation that caused changes in expression levels. Why? Because changes in gene expression values will not alter your DNA in most situations. You know? <laughs> so anyway, one influential paper that highlighted the role of SNPs as causal anchors was by Eric Schad. Um, and I um, urge you to read it. But coming back to then the network edge orienting problem. So let's assume we have various quantitative traits, uh, expression for gene one, expression for gene two, then we have um, HDL levels, in insulin levels, and you notice there are edges between these traits that indicate significant correlations. Further, what we have is we have genetic marker data. So there's chromosome one, chromosome two, and we have SNPs that are associated with these traits. And now what you see is the, the arrows actually contain, uh, sorry, there are arrows on these edges. Why? Because 
the minute a SNP is associated with one of the traits, we know the directionality. So in any event, this is, um, the edges are not yet oriented between these um, quantitative traits. However, the solution to the edge orienting <coughs> problem will be arrows. You know? So hopefully we have a software that will tell us that the expression levels of gene one lead to high, le expression, uh, high levels of HDL. High HDL levels change the gene expression levels of gene three. And um, so that's the solution. Now, this is, of course, statistics. And we are not completely sure um, of the statistical confidence. And so what we will do is we will calculate the so-called LEO score, local edge-orienting score, which is a number. And if this number is high enough, we will say we are very confident that this is the causal edge, you know, that this direction is as shown. So the NEO software is, a, is really an R script where you input quantitative trait variables, um, physiologic traits, um, gene expression data, and also SNP markers. And then the output will be an Excel file, for example, or some ask um, output that assigns scores to pairwise relationships. So, for example, there will be an Excel sheet, and you see the edge from A to B. A may be gene A, B is gene B, and there will be a score. And if this score is, let's say, bigger than one, then you say, I'm confident that A causes changes in B. So the um, underlying technique is really um, based on structural equation models. And I want to spend some time now on this slide. So look for, at the, um, this upper panel. You see um, a change from M to A to B. So that means, so M stands for marker, genetic marker. A is gene A. B is, of course, the other gene. And this is what we call um, causal scenario number one. Changes in the SNP lead to changes in A, which then subsequently cause changes in B. However, another situation is possible as well. Maybe the marker leads to changes in B, and changes in B cause changes in A. The third scenario is that the marker A leads to changes in A and B independently. You know? There is, in certain ways, no causal relationship between A and B. It's another way to say it is that M confounds the relationship between A and B. And this is yet another scenario, and that's yet another scenario. So when you have three variables, and one of them is a SNP, then these are the five causal situations that we evaluate. In your mind, you can think of additional edges, but the problem is we cannot test them. You know? <laughs> these, these are all the models that are, in certain ways, testable. Um, when you have multiple SNP markers, you can um, evaluate additional models. And um, right, So let's say you have three SNPs that affect A and another five SNPs that affect B. So you can evaluate this type of causal model. In certain ways, the more SNPs you have, the more precise will be your causal inference. There's only one little problem, which is reality. You know? <laughs> In reality, we don't have trustworthy SNPs. You know? How often do you have 10 SNPs that you really trust you know, to affect a certain trait? In practice, what you have is you have one SNP you really trust. You know, it's on chromosome two. It has a huge lot score for body weight, and that's the one SNP you want to use for causal inference. You know? And so, in the vast majority of applications, you're actually in this situation where you have a single marker. You know? But I do want to mention that the Neo software and, of course, many other tools that are out there in the do public domain allow you to incorporate many SNP markers. All right, so moving on. So, well, before I move on, I want to say one thing. Every model you see here in 
can be evaluated with the generalization of a multivariate regression model. You know? So the idea is we will fit some sort of a multivariate model to each of these five scenarios and we get a fitting index. And, and then we say, well, my data tell me that model one fits the data the best. And then you would say, okay, according to my data, A leads to changes in B. That's the idea. So what I need to teach you then is, well, how do we evaluate the fit of these models? You know? And um, for people who don't like math, now is the time to sleep. But for those who like math, I will go through it real quick. It's just one slide, you know. <laughs> so there is... Um, Fun there is a function. It's really similar to a likelihood. Um, and this function depends on parameters. And let's look at it. This function is the logarithm of the determinant of a variance-covariance matrix. So this causal model you he have here leads to um, a parametrization of the variances and covariances between these three variables. And and, and similar, but also you have another matrix that is simply the variances and covariances between these three variables. And so you take the logarithm of the determinant of this function minus the logarithm of that. You form traces. M is the number of variables. And for a given parameter setting, you get a real number. The higher... So what you want to do is you want to minimize this function. You know? what, what's the matrix? S is just the observed variance-covariance matrix. No model assumption. You just correlate things. You know? But sigma depends on parameters, and the parameters reflect the causal scenario. These are path coefficients and variances and so on. You know? And then there is an, um, an R package from, I think, John Fox, which is called SEM. You can install it, and that R package will literally then fit this function and find the parameter values that minimize that function. <coughs> so in any event, you get these values, and when you plug that into the function and you multiply times the sample size minus 1, you actually get a chi-square statistic. The chi-square statistic depends in some shape or form, of course, on the um, degrees of freedom, the number of variables, and therefore, you get a p-value. So going back, I will get a p-value for every single one of these scenarios. And what do you think? Do I want a high p-value or a low p-value? <laughs> Turns out you want a high p-value. Throughout biomedical research, you only ever get excited if you have a small p-value. But this in causal modeling, that's the one place where it's the opposite. You want as high a p-value as possible. And why? Because um, th fundamentally the test is whether the data do not fit the model. You know? So you want a high p-value so you don't reject the null hypothesis. You want, that the, you want to accept the null hypothesis because it says the data fit the model. All right. So... To give you even more details, every causal scenario that I just outlined actually de develop, uh, involves parameter values, path coefficient, noise parameters, and these are the parameters that are being um, evaluated by the SEM R package. You know. All right, so let's say we have now five p-values, right? One for each causal scenario. But the truth is, Often we have one causal scenario that's most exciting to us. We think that the genetic marker leads to changes in A and A leads to changes in B. And so we have this p-value, which hopefully is high, p-value 0.5. But then we have four other p-values corresponding to these causal scenarios, right? There's the opposite that M leads to changes in B and so on. We have four other p-values. So what we do is we take the maximum of these p-values and that's what we call the model fitting p-value of the next best model, right? So we form the ratio and we take the log 
um, of that ratio. You know? What does that mean? So coming to this first causal scenario, M, so I get a p-value, it's 0.5. Every, assume every other causal scenario leads to a p-value that is significant, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, and so on. The highest p-value that I observe is 0 0.05. Then I would have very good evidence that my first causal model fits really well. It's the only model that does not lead to a significant p-value. If I form the ratio 0.5 divided by 0.05, which is the p-value of the next best-fitting model, I get the number 10, and the number 10 tells me, well, the causal model, number one, fits the data better, 10 times better than any other model. And so by using then the log with base 10, I come up with a Leo score of one. And that's already the threshold. We say, if the Leo score is one, then my causal model fits 10 times better than any other model. We kind of like it, you know. And it turns out in simulations, you can also show it's, it's not a bad threshold, you know. It often retrieves the true signal. Yeah, so what we then um, do is we go through these algorithms, and for every um, pairing of A and B, we get a Leo score. Um, I... Um, yeah, so let me um, skip to an application. I fast forward a few slides because I want to give you a cute little example here. All right, this is a study from Giovanni Coppola and um, Yun Li and many others that were involved. And um, they um, were interested in a particular locus on chromosome 17. And they wanted to study um, whether this locus, think of it like a SNP. You could choose a single SNP, but basically it's a genetic marker in that locus. And it related to a certain neurodegenerative tauopathy. You know, you may have heard this um, tauopathies are certain um, degenerative diseases of the brain. All right. And so um, I like the example because it actually involved a methylation data. So here they had this. Um, genotype on chromosome 17, then they have an epigenetic marker, and then they have an, a quantitative trait, the PSP, um, gene expression levels. And they were all correlated. They have CPGs, uh, genetic, epigenetic markers that relate to the genotype and also to the PSP expression levels. But they want to know, well, is that the causal scenario? Is that the causal scenario? Is that the causal, or, or, or so on. You recognize these models. Here they included the very first model for the sake of completeness, but just so that you know, the statistical software cannot test it. You know? <laughs> Why? Because you don't have a degree of freedom left for the chi-square test. All right, and here's um, the output. So I just wanted to show you what a typical table looks like. So, um, so here we have different epigenetic markers. These are CPG dinucleotides from an Illumina array. And what you see here is that um, they have different LEO scores, the, the scores I just mentioned for causal inference, and many of them are negative. And that always means, negative means that this causal model does not fit at all, right? Our, Actually, the main model of interest is that the, uh, this one, the gene leads to changes in methylation in blood, and that relates to PSP. We yes? don't see your mouse, so... What's that? We don't see your mouse. Which model are you? Oh, you don't see my don't, mouse? No. Oh, so it's, all in, my it's all in my in my head. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh -huh. um, yes. So, yes. So this is, um, in your mind, you have a hypothesis. You say, my methylation marker in blood causes changes in PSP expression levels. That's the model you want to evaluate. You know? So you get a p-value for that. And of course, you get a p-value for all the other ones. And then you, form, you take the p-value for this model and divide it by the maximum of the four remaining p-values. Then, and what do you want? You want a high positive value. 
that we do a log transformation. If the ratio is less than one, and we do a log transformation, we get a negative value, which says the model doesn't fit at all. And anyway, here are the results. So here, um, for different methylation markers, we get these Leo scores, and you see many of them are negative. So this means this marker is not causal, not causal, not causal, until you find this CPG. This CPG is seems to be very causal. Oh, oh the lamp on. Um, so um, what we see here is that there's one CPG that leads to a very high LEO score of 1.51, all right? Um, and, and what does it mean? This haplotype, or this genetic marker, basically, leads to um, changes in the methylation level of this CPG, and that leads to changes in PSP. This model fits really well, you know? And it gives you a sense. You may have dozens of CPGs, but you want to find the CPG that has a causal role. And the Leo analysis, the Neo analysis allows you to get at it. But the critical input was really the genetic marker, the, this locus. It was a well-known locus to play a role in tauopathies. It, there's a lot of literature that corroborates it, and it, on that, and therefore the um, model is trustworthy. Yeah. Um, let me. Um, do you have any question at this point? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me come to another application, perhaps, real quick, from my colleague um, Paivi Payukanta and Chris Plaisir. So they were interested in finding um, causal genes for hyperlipidemia. Okay. And um, familial combined hyperlipidemia is characterized by high fasting triglyceride levels and total cholesterol and so on. And it turned out that Paivi Payukanta had carried out a linkage analysis and found one SNP to be very much associated with this hyperlipidemia. And then she went out to collect additional data in, from a different population from um, Mexican families, um, and she looked for 70 extremely discordant individuals, basically 35 individuals that are highly hyperlipidemic and 35 controls. And she generated gene expression data on the AFI array. And she found that then this um, SNP, sure enough, related to um, um, expression levels, but let me not, um, let me mention this. So, um, oh, for the biologists in the room, let me mention what was exciting about the data is that it was actually human adipose tissue, you know, it's not blood, <laughs> which arguably for hyperlipidemia, adipose tissue is more relevant. But in any event, so then um, Chris Plaisir um, found 28 modules in adipose tissue, and here are the eigengenes, and he correlated these eigengenes with uh, lipidemia status, total cholesterol, triglyceride levels, and you see the very last um, column are, is really the SNP, you know. And when you look at the heat map, there's one module that really stands out, which is the TAN module in the middle, right? This TAN module is positively correlated with disease status, cholesterol levels, in particular triglyceride levels, but very excitingly also with the SNP. And do you see this is actually a very high correlation? I mean, and um, so then, so this TAN module contained 504 genes. And what we want to know, well, which of these 500 genes causes the disease, right? I mean, so we need a causal inference. And one way to do it is then to take this SNP as a um, causal anchor and to prioritize all the module genes in terms of um, evidence that they 
cause changes in disease status. So um, the fact, just to reiterate, just that this, um, the fact that this SNP relates to pretty much most module genes is, is really allows you to prioritize um, the genes. And um, here what we did is, um, um, let me um, back off for a second and say this. The very first analysis that we did was to relate the module eigengene to the trait, right? So we have this SNP, and we want to test whether the module eigengene mediates the effect of the SNP on the trait. And the evidence for that was rather weak, you know, for, for that type of an analysis. We got, an, we got a, um, a Leo score of 0.31. Truth be told, it's only suggestive, you know, for that type of, but still, I mean, it, it at least indicates that um, there's um, some causal signal. So, per, yeah, go ahead. No, it wasn't. Right? Yeah. Uh, so the question was whether the SNP is co-locates with one of the genes in the module. It, it wasn't. But that would be, of course, very exciting if you could show that. Again, Mendelian randomization type of an argument would suggest that's it. You know? Yeah. So perhaps a more, so in reality, I think what will happen is that when you have a module that relates to a trait, it will contain some genes that are causative and some are reactive to the trait, you know. And so perhaps the more meaningful analysis is to really um, do this causal anal analysis on one gene at a time. And so when Chris Plezier did that, he found that 171 of these genes were um, causal for triglyceride levels, but only 18 were causal for um, familiar combined hyperlipidemia status. And these 18 genes were then presented here in this table, you know. And then um, many of these genes are known to play a role in lipid metabolism. And also, it turned out some of these genes had been implicated in GWAS studies of hyperlipidemia, which again corroborated um, the fact that there may, may be a causal signal, you know. All right. So, yeah, any question? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. What's, um, yeah, I, I think we, if it's okay, so the question is what's the difference between that causal inference and the epistasis approach? Yeah, yeah I can't answer that. I'm, I'm not sure. I would need to discuss um, with you how you fit an epistasis model, you know. Yeah, other question? Yeah. You can certainly, yeah. Um, so are you saying whether I can, so you know, it doesn't show anymore. I don't know what, what's going on. <laughs> but um, no, I think I know what's going on. So the, so the question is, can you apply to all genes in the network? For example, 20,000 gene transcripts, you know. Absolutely you can, you know. In principle, there was no need to restrict attention to only the 500 genes, you know. However, I do want to say you should only do the causal network analysis for gene transcripts that at least have some correlation with the SNP, right? You, you want to filter it because the causal model assumes that there are correlations between these edges, right? So the trait must relate to the gene and the gene expression level, and the gene expression level should also have some relationship with the SNP, you know. If nothing correlates with each other, no need to do a causal fit. It's meaningless, you know. Yeah. Uh, yes. Maybe, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, um, take all of these results with a big grain of salt, you know. But on the other hand, I want to say this. I really like the fact that we look at what I call triads, the three variables, you know. There are far more sophisticated tools out there. These Bayesian networks come to mind. You know, there's a rich literature on Bayesian networks. And, um, but the, pe the people who really analyze this data, all of us sleep bad at night uh, because we worry about noise, you know. <laughs> the gene expression levels are very noisy and noise really has a strong effect on causal inference, you know. And so even this method that is f honing in on very trustworthy variables, meaning you have a very trustworthy SNP, you have a trustworthy module, you know, which um, is enriched with lipid um, metabolism related genes. So you kind of focus on genes that are plausible. You um, reduce the hypothesis space, but even there we are all nervous, you know. So whatever you find from a causal analysis, you always need additional validation data, you know. A lot can go wrong. I just wanted to use uh, five or more minutes to show you some code from the, from our um, our tutorial. So if we go back to the WGCNA tutorial, um, I'm trying to get it to so you can see it. I don't know um, what happened here. Um, is somebody good with computers? And I don't know which <laughs> button to push you because you don't see anything. And, oh no! I, now I know what button to push. Let me try this. <laughs> I need to do a duplicate, you know. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, so there is a section. There is a section in your tutorial called Systems Genetic Analysis with Neo. And here I um, show you how to use structural equation model code, but in practice you would just copy and paste it, you know. So you would copy and paste this code into your R session. Um, let me just do that here. Yes, I, I will do that, yeah. But um, let me just show you this. I um, copy and paste it. And before I show you the input, let me start with the output, you know. <laughs> So here the input, there's an R function called Leo single anchor, meaning single causal anchor, meaning one single SNP. So you input one SNP, and as trait A, we input the um, module eigen of the blue module. Why? Because the blue module was related to mouse body weight. Treat, uh, trait B is mouse body weight, right? And what my goal is to show or to test whether changes in the blue module cause changes in body weight. And notice the Leo score is negative. So the answer is not at all, you know. I, and in hindsight, I now, I, that makes sense because it turns out this module is in, enriched with inflammatory markers. Clearly it's the other way around, you know. High body weight leads to inflammation of the liver. So the directionality, if anything, is the opposite. Similarly, the, there was another module very related to mouse body weight. Again, Leo score is negative, which means this module as a whole is not causative. However, what you can do is you can ask, well, in that blue module, are there um, individual genes that may be causative? And that can be done um, by running a for loop, so one module at a time, um, so I'm going through the for loop, and what you see is for every gene I get a Leo score, and this Leo score for some genes is very high. That's a, why is it high? Because it's on a log 10 scale, you know. So this means this gene, the causal evidence for this gene is a thousand times higher than that of the competing model, you know. So arguably, if you wanted to do validation tests um, to find genes that may cause changes in body weight, these are the candidates you would want to manipulate. 
Now, um, coming to your question of the input, so first of all, um, the, we have here um, this library, the SEM library, that we um, need to install. And here, you notice the code for this is written in small font. And when I put something in small font, it means don't mess with it and, and don't, don't try to understand it, you know? That, that's really the, the rationale, yeah. But basically, but if you must know, I will tell you. So basically, each one of these is a causal model. Remember, we have five causal models. So this is the R code for specifying causal model one. This is the R code for causal model two, and so on. And so you copy and paste these causal models. Then what you have is there is, um, for each causal model, we want to evaluate the fit statistics. And therefore, what we do is we use the SEM command and use as, um, maybe I should actually zoom a bit more. I'm sorry about that. So, so we apply the SEM command to the causal model that I just outlined earlier. Then here, S is, is the variance and covariance matrix, you know. And then once I have the causal model, I can get the model fitting p-value that we just discussed. Remember, we get five p-values. Here they are. And here's then the Leo score, you know. This is just the ratio of these p-values, you know. Now, I should tell you, for the SEM R package, there are wonderful tutorials. If you just do a Google search, SEM R software tutorial, you'll find material from uh, John Fox, who created it. I invite you to do it, but um, yeah. So here you show, you see how I use it, you know. So I, uh, I have one single SNP, which I labeled by the location of a QTL. I have mouse body weight, I have the ME blue, and here's then the code I use for fitting the causal model. You know? Yes. Yes. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So a prerequisite is that you code the um, genetic marker in a numeric fashion. So most people will count the minor alleles for 0, 1, 2. But others, you may have some sort of recessive model or dominant model. At least that, you know. But it must be numeric. All the variables I have here must be numeric. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. All right, with that, we'll take a, a break. I mean, it gives you a glimpse of causal analysis. I just wanted you to know that there's structural equation models. I love them personally. I, I, why do I love it? Because it's really a direct generalization of multivariate regression. I have a very good in, intuition with multivariate regression. Um, Bayesian models um, are also good, you know, but it's, um, it's just a different um, school of thought, you know. And, uh, Stop, yeah, go ahead.